It's only less than 12,000 years that divide us from the first stone sickles to the first satellites, computers, and nuclear power plants. The story of this jump takes you to historical crossroads, to hunter-gatherers, and in a weird way, this is a story about ancient agriculture and ultimately about ancient genetics. Modern interpretation of the history of agriculture is that this is a natural transition from hunting and gathering. But some researchers now argue that the agriculture has religious rather than economic roots. Surprisingly, most of the ancient legends and stories tell us a similar story. None of the nations credited themselves or their ancestors with transition to agriculture is their invention. In all legends and stories we read that agriculture was granted to people by the gods. They gave tools, taught techniques. In Sumer they worked together with people on creation of water irrigation and drainage channels. So, what they all say is that agriculture was brought to people rather than invented by them. Ancient witnesses claim that they were gifted agricultural techniques, tools, and even already improved wheat varieties. It makes sense because wild wheats are a very unattractive appearance. Brittle rakes, small seeds, etc. Most of the first farmers could not even harvest each year. First of all, we should understand that when we talk about ancient agriculture, it's not the modern one. If we will use the mainstream theory, we should talk about use of the wild wheat, when its spike has not 20 or 30 seeds, but 2, 3 or just 4 at max, and these seeds are very weak and small. But then, suddenly, around 10 to 12,000 years ago, we see a lot of domesticated wheat varieties that pop up across the globe. What happened? Nearly a century ago, Nikolai Ivanovich Vavilov, one of Russia's and indeed the world's most brilliant botanists, researched in detail a question of the origins of bread wheat. And the results of his research are very important for many reasons. If we talk about 100% high technology on ancient objects, where we have 100% of proven facts without any doubts, then this area is not only strictly limited to the equatorial zone, these are very local areas. Some time ago, I accidentally found Avilov's research who discovered eight centers of the ancient agriculture. So the places where we found traces of ancient hard technologies and match completely his ancient centers of agriculture. In his book, Origin and Geography of Cultivated Plants, Vavilov came to some very important conclusions. Ancient agricultural centers that directly related to the birth of the first civilizations appeared independently from each other, and the transition to the cultivated plants happened in all those centers practically at the same time, approximately 10 to 12,000 years ago. Vavilov discovered that all varieties of cultivated plants came from just eight independent regions that were very limited in area. Geographically, these regions fit a pretty narrow belt that follows the main mountain ranges. So one of the things that is um, clear about origins of agriculture and plant domestication is that it happened more than once in more than one region. Regions that are, have plausibly independent uh, domestication of, of crops. All of these regions have one thing in common, tropical or subtropical climate type, which means these regions are the best for hunting and gathering, and there is no economical reasons in agriculture at all. It's an untold story of hunter-gatherers that actually in famines in South Africa that have, that have occurred, it's the agriculturalists who starve, the hunter-gatherers are just fine. Why should anybody learn to plant when all you have to do is go outside the palisades or whatever it is that keeps you safe, shoot a rhinoceros or whatever it is. 
Vavilov discovered not just one, as it is believed by mainstream historians, but three independent places for the origin of wheat. Syria and Palestine are the homelands of the wild wheat and single-grain wheat. Ethiopia is homeland of the hard wheat. The foothills of the western Himalayas is homeland to the soft wheat varieties. Moreover, he concludes that there is no reason to believe that Fertile Crescent was a place of origin of a domesticated wheat at all. His conclusion was supported by recent archaeological discoveries as well. Not only the place of origin, but genetics of the breadweed is a great riddle by itself. The differences between wild wheat and breadweed are so crucial that they do not crossbreed even when they have the same chromosome number. Bread wheat hybrids are completely different types on its own. In these regions, varieties of wheat don't cross breed in the first place. They also have different chromosome number 14, 28, 42 chromosomes. So we see duplication and triplication of the genome. When biologists say to me that this is quite an ordinary situation to have gene duplication, I answer that this is common just for some parts of DNA, but not for the full genome duplication or triplication. Excuse me, this doesn't happen on its own, this is artificial. This absolutely clear traces of the genetic manipulation. Chromosome duplication is the task that is very complex, even for modern geneticists. Such a result is very hard to achieve by classical plant selection, if at all, and it requires deep knowledge and technologies for gene manipulation. Because of the complexity of, uh, of the genome, it's, it's huge, it's about five times the size of the, the human genome, and uh, it's also very complicated. Um, it's actually three separate genomes together. Genome duplication of the bread wheat was done in ancient times way before the modern biologists developed techniques that allow us to do that now. Nowadays, we use so-called chemical mutagens and radiation exposure that force the chromosome duplication. Whatever the ancient genetics approach was is a complete mystery. It is clear that such complex technologies were far beyond the possibilities of ancient people with wooden sticks and stone sickles. George Wilcox, French archaeobotanist at CNRS France, proved experimentally that under conditions which more closely mimic early farming, selection for domestication could take millennia rather than centuries. The facts are, and archaeological data proves this, is that different bread wheat were used in a ready-to-use form from the very beginning of the ancient agriculture across the globe, starting 10 to 12,000 years ago and in at least at least 11 independent regions. Bread wheat cultivation and domestication has been directly associated with the spread of agriculture and settled societies, and it is now one of the most widely cultivated crops owing to its high yields and nutritional and processing qualities. Wheat genome is extraordinarily complex. In fact, it doesn't have one genome. It is compiled from three different plant genomes packed into one. I guess it's been described as the Mount Everest of, of, of crop, uh, and that's in part because of the complexity of, uh, of the genome. It's, it's huge, and uh, it's also very complicated. Um, it's actually three separate genomes together. It's a wheat, bread wheat is a result of hybridization during the domestication process. So uh, you end up with that level of complexity. Think of it as a, as a huge billion-piece jigsaw uh, puzzle. In comparison to the bread wheat gene order of the wild wheat is conserved, very slender and consistent. Its DNA structure is something that was polished by evolution for millions of years. But in the DNA of the bread wheat, many small disruptions to conserved gene order were identified. Its genome is highly dynamic with significant loss of gene family members on chromosome number increase and domestication, and 
an abundance of gene fragments. What were added are several classes of genes involved in energy harvesting, metabolism and growth and for crop productivity. It looks like they used gene family members of goat grass photosynthetic machine, spare proteins, a lot of transposons, genes that were used for genome programming, retro elements, several protection elements and some pollen allergens. There are two important moments for us at this point. First, DNA of the breadweed does have fingerprints of gene manipulation done in ancient times. And second, that gene modifications was not only done successfully, but correctly. There are some interesting moments here. First, we all grew up on genetically modified products. We consume them thousands of years and nothing really bad happens to us. No harm whatsoever. So genetically modified products can be consumed, but, excuse me, genetic modification must be done in the right way. And by the way, we can find a hint for our new technologies and knowledge in these ancient genetically modified weeds that Vavilov researched. Surprisingly, Vavilov didn't find any transitional forms from wild wheat in regions with a domesticated wheat. In fact, we have pure absence of any traces of the domestication in what was supposed to be their homeland regions. For example, in Ethiopia, where you can find a maximum variety of a domesticated grain, there are no wild types of wheat at all. This means that genetic modification of wheat was done in some other geographic region, different from the home region of the wild plant, which is exactly what ancient legends say. People didn't domesticate wild wheat. It was brought to these regions by those who they remembered as gods. A fascinating fact is that such legends and stories dedicated to the ancient agriculture existed in all known regions where the first civilizations were born. Same goes for the ancient Egypt. Agriculture, the art of field irrigation, use of Nile slime was taught by God Osiris. Same goes for the ancient Mexico. An ancient Mexico goddess granted maize grains to the Aztecs. Corn in Mexico was granted by the great god Quetzalcoatl. Viracocha taught people agriculture in Peruvian Andes. Osiris granted the art of agriculture to the people of ancient Ethiopia and Egypt. In the ancient Sumer, it was Enki and Enlil, gods who came from the heavens and gifted the seeds of wheat and barley. The Chinese were taught agriculture by heavenly genies and lords of wisdom who brought fruits and grains not known to Tibet. Here is an outstanding fact. Ancient witnesses never told in their legends and stories that it was them or their ancestors who actually invented agriculture. But if it was not our ancestors, who were these ancient geneticists? No dispute, this knowledge would be part of a highly advanced civilization. Civilization of those who once ruled the earth and were remembered in legends as the gods. Representatives of this civilization were known by different names in different parts of the world. In Tiahuaneaco, they are remembered in local traditions as the Viracocha people that had done agricultural experiments of an advanced and scientific nature in the Altiplano region. I think that the city of Tiwanaku is one of the most mysterious sites in the world. In a way, it's the New World equivalent of Giza, that legendary god Viracocha, who came with his demigods, the Viracochas, to South America long, long ago, who's remembered in all those myths. Tall, pale-skinned, bearded figure. And his description does not fit in any way the description of the indigenous inhabitants of that region. When the Spanish first arrived in the Andes, they asked the Incas, did you build these monuments? And the Incas laughed. They said, no way. 
We didn't build these monuments. These monuments were built thousands of years ago by the gods. Research by David Broman, Associate Professor of Anthropology at Washington University, has demonstrated that astonishingly sophisticated analyses of the chemical compositions of many poisonous high-altitude plants had been undertaken by somebody in this region in the furthest antiquity. Such analyses, furthermore, had been coupled with the invention of detoxification techniques techniques, which had rendered these otherwise nutritious vegetables harmless and edible. Modern historians don't have satisfactory explanations for the development of this detoxification process. Remembered in tradition as gods, they deliberately forced transition from hunting-gathering to agriculture. The consequences of such were probably one of the most exciting and the most tragic chapters in the history of humankind. People still argue a lot about how agriculture happened, but it happened, and it happened in five different places in the planet, at least independently, so in some ways it was inevitable. But once that happened, then people started um, raising grain and became highly dependent on that grain and highly dependent on city living. From the progressivist perspective, adoption of agriculture was inevitable. Of course, ancient people adopted it because agriculture is an efficient way to get more food for less work, right? The life of the hunter-gatherer was what historians have traditionally regarded as nasty, brutish, and short. There is no respite from the struggle that starts anew each day to find wild foods and avoid starving. Agricultural benefits are obvious, and that's why people adopted it. That's how it is in theory, but in reality... Agricultural revolution in terms of the early guys who adopted it, at least, was a terrible mistake. People thought that it was a good idea. People today also look back at the agricultural revolution and think it was a big step forward. Agriculture, for most individuals, was bad news. I would agree that totalitarian agriculture has been a disaster. If it was so bad for us, why did our ancestors decide to start agriculture at all? Well, did they? Until 13 and a half thousand years ago, everybody everywhere in the world was living as a hunter-gatherer, obtaining their food by hunting wild animals and gathering wild plants and small wild animals. Hunter-gatherer societies have for the most part been nomadic or semi-nomadic, meaning that they shift camp every few days up to every few weeks or months, and that's because the wild plants and animals on which they depend for food, again, either move or else fruiting and flowering is at different places and different seasons, so hunter-gatherers have to move camp to track their changing food supply. Apparently, hunting and gathering has incredibly high efficiency. Scattered throughout the world, several dozen groups of so-called primitive people, like the Kalahari Bushmen, continue to support themselves that way. It turns out that these people have plenty of leisure time, sleep a good deal, and work less than their farming neighbors. They typically spend less than half of their waking hours in what we might call work, and the rest of the time in repose and in what an anthropologist might call cultural elaboration. Yeah, it's hard, to, hard for people to accept the fact that the more you base your society on agriculture, the harder you work. Because of our ancestors hunting for hundreds of thousands of years, we naturally feel joy and happiness while we hunt or gather. Even the physiology of our bodies became more adapted for hunting rather than work on the field. On the contrary, agricultural activity was perceived as a hard, repetitive and boring job. That's why it feels very alien to our human nature. It was far from paradise, but in many respects their lives were better than the lives of most people after the agricultural revolution. First of all because their jobs were more interesting and, more, uh, and their bodies and minds were more adapted to what they were actually doing. The bodies and minds of Homo sapiens evolved for hundreds of thousands of years in adaptation to life as hunter-gatherers. It's useful, I think, to appreciate in a larger sense how the domestication of plants as farming enmeshed us in an elaborate annual set of routines that organized our work life, our settlement patterns, our social structures, and our ritual life. The crop organizes much of our timetable. 
For instance, the average time devoted each week to obtaining food is only 12 to 19 hours for one group of bushmen, 14 hours or less for the Hadza nomads of Tanzania. It was in many ways much, much more relaxed than life today. It it's just seems to defy intuition. All your food out there planted and go you know, harvest it. You don't have to. You don't have to go hunting for it or anything like that. But the fact is that when we were hunting for it and collecting it, you know, we, <laughs> we didn't have to plant it. We just had to go and get it. That's why one bushman, when asked why he hadn't emulated neighboring tribes by adopting agriculture, replied, why should we, when there are so many mongongo nuts in the world? The standard narrative is really making a claim that the first farmers spent a lot of effort to harvest crops and then have a lot of free leisure time until next season. But it's easy to forget that when we are talking about primitive agriculture, it was not as effective as the modern one. First of all, we should understand that when we are talking about transition to ancient agriculture, this is not a modern agriculture, when its spike has not 20, 30 seeds, but 2, 3 or just 4 at max. And you should do all the hard work by hands. So the results you will get will be much worse than we have today. In addition, they started practicing fixed field agriculture, which is very hard and labor intensive. Fixed field agriculture is far more labor intensive. Plow agriculture was avoided until population pressure and or a property system forced people into it. And when conditions allow, people exit this form of agriculture. Then they've made things even worse and choose the most difficult type of crop processing one can ever imagine. The first problem is to get the wheat seed from the hard and durable shell. You can't do that without tools, so the whole new industry of stone pestles and mortars must be created. But the main difficulties awaited just ahead. Now you could grind seeds that you've harvested on stone millstones. In fact, the kind of agriculture that early humans practiced was onerous and involved a tremendous amount of work. They did all that hard work, even though you can simply cook porridge from grain without loss in calories and doing less. So what did the first farmer receive in return for their efforts? It is believed that people have solved all their food problems and become independent from vagary of nature. But did they? There are numerous ethnographic researches, there are plenty of such researches, that proves that transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture was extremely unprofitable for an ancient man. A simple analysis of the life of the ancient farmers proves that in many aspects, the life got much worse. We started moving a lot less uh, because we were sedentary. We lived in cities. Um, we were able to store grain, and because we could store grain, that was wealth. Because there was wealth, there was poverty. Uh, there was hierarchy. There were leaders. There were people who in control, which we had never experienced before. There were institutions like churches and government, which never existed before. And those things served to organize society and regiment society in ways that we could continue to produce our food. It also had adverse consequences on health. Hunter-gatherer skeletons are much larger because they had fewer interruptions in growth and their bones show almost no signs of malnutrition. If we look at archaeological sites around the world, where people have done this, in all the locations, this is not a cultural issue, in all the locations where agriculture began, in Asia, in the Mideast, South America, and Central America, in every case, archaeologists can find um, skeletal remains of agricultural people and contemporaneous hunters and gatherers, people who lived at the same time. And in every case, the hunter-gatherers were larger, were much taller, they were not diseased, they didn't have teeth decay, all those issues. And if we look at the, at the agricultural people, we will find people who are stunted, short, their teeth are invariably gone because of the carbohydrates they're eating, turn into sugars and rot their teeth out. They're misshapen, they're asymmetrical, they show every evidence of suffering all sorts of disease. It's clear that people outside these grain civilizations were healthier than the people inside. Farmers are now attached to the land they work on, and in the event of adverse conditions, they cannot move to other places like hunter-gatherers did, which causes severe famines amongst them. 
In fact, hunger as a phenomenon appeared with the first agricultural societies. Hunter-gatherers, if there is some natural calamity, like a drought, then yes, life is worse, but if some plants don't grow like last year, you always have other options. Mm. With farmers, if the yearly uh, um, harvest of wheat or rice is down, there is no other option and you have mass starvation. Moreover, the grain diet itself is health damaging. It doesn't have the variety of micro-elements we need and narrowed the diet that turned out mostly carbohydrates. And on top of that, the diet of most people before the agricultural revolution was significantly better. Hunter-gatherers subsisted by eating dozens of different species of animals and plants and mushrooms and berries and so forth, so they got all the nutrients and vitamins they needed. Uh, farmers, after agriculture came, subsisted mainly by eating a single crop, like rice in East Asia or wheat in the Middle East, so their nutrition was far worse. To add insult to injury, the first farmers were more vulnerable to epidemics and were suffering from a lot of diseases caused by overpopulation. Now, does this transition to agriculture still look natural and logical? It is clear that it was not. But what could be the true reasons that forced ancient people to switch from traditional hunting to the hard and less efficient agriculture? Go to Gobekli Tepe, you're 7,000 years earlier. The entire area prior to the appearance of Gobekli Tepe is inhabited only by hunter-gatherers. There's no agriculture whatsoever. They haven't built anything ever. And then suddenly, without any background or any preparation, appears this huge megalithic site, which is incredibly sophisticated, that the whole site is actually 50 times bigger than Stonehenge and 7,000 years older. So how do we account for this? Did a group of hunter-gatherers in Turkey wake up one morning, magically inspired, that they suddenly knew how to cut and quarry stone, move blocks weighing in some cases up to 50 tons, create gigantic stone circles in an area with no water, involving bringing a labor force and organizing that labor force and feeding and watering them, to create the world's first perfectly north-south aligned building, which involves accurate astronomy, to do all of that, and at the same time to invent agriculture. Because at the same moment that Gobekli Tepe pops up, suddenly agriculture appears in that same region of Turkey. It's obvious to me that that wasn't a group of hunter-gatherers who woke up one morning suddenly equipped with the skills. What we're looking at is a transfer of technology. We know that the first agricultural experiments were started 10 to 12,000 years ago after some global cataclysm that was accompanied with climate change and mass extinction of animals. Maybe this climate link could explain why people started looking for alternatives such as agriculture. In fact, it is not. The thing is, the catastrophe that occurred had global characteristics, which means that not only animals were killed, but humans as well. Less population means that it needs less food to feed themselves. That is what a lot of ancient legends and stories tell us, that after the flood catastrophe, only a small group of people survived. Another thing to consider is that the first reaction of the hunter-gatherers to any cataclysm is the search for food in new places and not an invention of new forms of activity. That was already proven by various ethnographic researchers. And another moment is that nature quickly recovers itself. One group of animals substitute another, and even though it can take an extended period of time, it's definitely less time than to invent develop and master complex techniques of agriculture. And in fact, there's a lot of evidence that during severe natural conditions, people rolled back from agriculture to hunting and gathering. It's simply more effective. Finally, there's abundant evidence from many sites that wherever there has been a dramatic drop in population because of epidemics, war, or famine, the remaining population typically shifts toward less intensive, labor-saving means of subsistence. In that case, natural disasters cannot be a true reason for agricultural revolution as well. Any hunter-gatherer has survival skills in the wild. It's not a problem for them. 
so it's clear that people didn't have any natural reasons to switch to agriculture. But it happened anyway. Why? Ancient legends and stories tell us that transition to agriculture has nothing to do with the development of new ways of food production. It happened under the influence of the third external force. Ancients told about powerful gods from the heavens who came to them and taught them agriculture. And a lot of researchers today came to the same conclusion that agriculture had not economic, but rather religious roots. The history of religion is perfectly intertwined with the history of agriculture. That the priest arose at the same time that wheat arose and kings arose. And it was a vehicle for control and for social control. And I'm here to subvert that control. And religion is a part of that. And on top of that, they suffered far more from exploitation and social hierarchies. Mm. Only with, with the agricultural revolution do you begin to see the formation of small elites, of kings and priests and soldiers that control and exploit masses of uh, peasants and workers. So from all these perspectives, it seems that the life of the hunter-gatherers, maybe 50,000 years ago, were, at least in some respects, much better than the lives of most people uh, that came after them. Now, we should pay extra attention to the fact of an extremely tight connection of agriculture to religion in all ancient places of its origin. This connection with ancient gods was a driving force that stimulated a lot of the first farming. At the beginning, agriculture was established as a cult. But technology by itself is never enough. You always need to combine technology with cooperation. You cannot invent and produce and use sophisticated technology unless you somehow manage to uh, to build systems of cooperation that unite thousands or millions or billions of human beings. And in order to establish such cooperation, you need a good story. You need an ideological story or a religious story that people uh, would accept, would believe. And it seems like some very good stories were told to the first farmers in the right way and not by abstract but by real gods. The gods who are not spirits, but some representatives of the highly advanced civilization that not only possess agricultural know-how, they knew how to build these systems of cooperation amongst humans. Right now, we are in our expeditions. We are finding traces of the technologies that are much more advanced than the modern one. These are stonework technologies, building technologies, and these are on the big planetary scale. Thus, we deal with the real facts of existence of some ancient civilization on our planet that was not only more advanced than all ancient cultures, but also more advanced than our civilization, because we face the facts of such a high level of technologies. Thus, we have a question about how representatives of such a highly advanced civilization were perceived by ancient people, like ancient Egyptians or ancient Sumerians, Greeks, and so forth. It is natural to assume they would think about them as the gods. Why not? And in fact, they called them like these gods and described marvelous acts of these gods in their stories. We will not dive into details now about who exactly these gods were, but according to the most ancient myths and legends, they looked and behaved pretty much the same as humans would. The only difference was that their possibilities and knowledge were far beyond that of ancient people. Now imagine these gods reached ancient hunters and gatherers at some point and then granted agriculture to them as literally a gift from the gods. How would the first farmers react? As with any other sacred knowledge, a cult was established. And because of that, people would preserve this knowledge rather than doing their own domestication experiments. Virtually every economic crop that we know of today that's a major crop in world trade uh, was invented by the sophisticated applied botanists. They domesticated all of these plants and historical man has added not a single major plant to this uh, suite of uh, important plants. 
If we consider the influence of the third force in a form of representatives of the highly advanced civilization, it will fill a lot of gaps in the mystery of transition to agriculture. First of all, the above analysis proves that there weren't any natural reasons for transition from hunting and gathering to agriculture. Second, legends and stories explain why we have such an odd variety of cultural wheats that not only don't relate to each other genetically, they didn't grow in regions with a wild wheat. That's because these were brought and given to people by the gods as already domesticated wheats. Third, the version of the gift of the highly advanced civilization can explain the traces of genetic modification of the ancient wheat and the other plants. And there is another interesting fact that came from an unexpected place – linguistics. Linguists noticed that there is a very curious similarity amongst different languages' vocabulary dedicated to religion. But most importantly, a giant amount of similar terms that refers directly to agriculture. Specialists are talking about whole sections of words that are very similar to each other, such as cultivation of land, cultivated plants, terms related to harvesting, tools and material for their manufacture. It makes sense, because by granting to people the new technologies, so-called gods would give it some specific names. According to ancient legends and stories across all the places of origins of agriculture, the things that were granted by them are pretty much the same. It is logical to conclude that these gods were representatives of the same civilization, thus they used the same specific terms in their language. This can answer the question of why we have similar agricultural terms across different languages and amongst different cultures that in fact were not in contact before, because these facts have one common ancient source. Agricultural revolution might look like it does a positive impact on human civilization, thus gods were acting as progressors to less developed hunter-gatherer societies, stimulating development of humankind in general. But the facts are that they did it in their own interests. Moreover, it put a hard toll on the people. Mesopotamian myths are very straightforward about the goal of humans' creation. We were created so gods can lay all the hard physical work on us. We were slaves. The fact that humans were created as slaves was not something new or special for ancient people. In prehistoric times, the revered deity was called Lord, Sovereign, King, Ruler, Master. Some of the words that are traditionally translated as worship actually have the meaning of work. Ancient man did not worship his gods. He worked for them. At the same time, we rapidly increased our need for humans. People usually put that backwards. They say agriculture allowed population increase. What really happened is we had a need for excess humans because agriculture is dependent on stoop labor. A whole lot of poor people who go out and do the work to feed rich people. So that kind of social inequity began almost immediately with agriculture. Hunter-gatherers are famous for having their communities based on the principle that all people are equal and deserve equal rights and opportunities. But increased population because of agriculture demands new structure for society. The interesting thing about hierarchies, about the rule within hunter-gatherer camp camps, the interesting thing is there is none. How might one tell the story of how we as a species uh, were assembled in great clumps growing grain, tending livestock, and governed by the political units we call states and empires. One led to another. Increased population demands new political units, states, that according to the legends and stories were also established by the representatives of advanced civilizations through religion in all religions of ancient agriculture. That has to be done in order to control and manage the first states. Once the gods established early agricultural societies, they created the basis for systematic class distinctions that could be perpetuated between generations. And that's how you get the kinds of massive hierarchies and inequalities we see today. 
all of these things, of course, make it more difficult for these plants to thrive in the wild. We have created then with these plants a kind of floral zoo of basket cases, which we have to defend every day against the wild, lest they not survive. They need our constant attention. We think of ourselves, Homo sapiens, as the agent in this narrative. We domesticated the potato, we domesticated maize, rice, etc. But if we squint at the matter from a slightly different angle, it's we who have become domesticated. If you are born blue bloods like your husband, thinking up skyscrapers, his wife's a proper blue blood, I'll give you a clue. Darius, we can't keep the princess waiting. Blue blood, you know. Why do we keep referring to something like blue blood? Human blood is actually red. Usually, we use this term specifically to address a member of a wealthy, upper-class family or ancestry. But why exactly blue blood? Not green, not red, but blue. We may find an answer in ancient legends and stories. In the ancient world, the right to rule was something only gods and their blood descendants had. The question is, what is the meaning of the term gods? When ancients were talking about different fields of human knowledge, all of them agree on the same thing. This knowledge or that technology were granted by those who they called gods. The question is how to understand the term gods. We can think about them as fiction or a myth, a deification of ancestors. But we can also think about them as representatives of some highly advanced civilization, much more advanced than our ancient ancestors. For instance, if we took an ancient Roman and put him into our civilization with all our technologies, television, internet and so on, for him it would look like a civilization of gods. We should point out that in legends, ancient gods weren't spirits in the modern understanding. They had flesh and they were living amongst humans. So we are talking about some representatives of a highly advanced civilization, most likely exo-civilization, who were technologically superior to our ancestry and whom our ancients treated like gods. But what if those ancient gods literally had blue blood? This could be used to prove that one is a descendant of the sacred family and has the full right to rule. But what if the blue blood phenomenon was a real thing? Something that was very specific to the ancient gods' physiology. So what is blue blood? Human blood is red. One of its main functions is the transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide, as well as various nutrients to the cells and the transport of metabolic waste products away from those same cells. Oxygen is the principal element that our body uses for energy production via very complex chemical processes. The important thing for us is that, as a side product of these reactions, a lot of carbon dioxide in our body is produced and must be removed constantly. So transferring these gases is the main function of the blood. To do so, it has special molecules with a metal ion in them. We call them respiratory pigments. Human respiratory pigment is hemoglobin. It's bright red when oxygenated, and it's red because of ions in the metal ion in it. But even with a metal ion-based blood, its colors may vary from green to violet. As it turns out, Oxygen can be carried by other metal ions as well, so evolution didn't limit itself in choice here. Surprisingly, we have species with blue-colored blood on our planet too. This color is caused by hemocyanin, a respiratory pigment based not on iron, but copper. In fact, this pigment is very widespread in the sea life world. Some snails, spiders, crustaceans, cuttlefish, crabs and octopi have blue blood, not red. Actually, blue blood exists. For example, mollusks, octopuses have it. This is a copper-based blood. If we substitute iron of iron to iron of copper, we will get hemocyanin. In other words, blue blood. But is it possible that not just lower animals, but hominids, can have a blue blood as well. 
It was scientifically proved, and has been known for a long time, that the environment can greatly affect the elemental composition of living organisms. This is accompanied by a change in the chemical composition of the body. There can be chemical mutants with changes in the nucleus, such as chromosome numbers and so on. And such variability can become hereditary. It's understandable that in a situation where there's a particular element deficiency, evolution will substitute it with one that is in abundance to secure its mission. On our planet, evolution bet on the iron-based blood that is common for most organisms. Iron is constantly circulated in our body, just as any other micro-element. 90% of it stays in the body and then is re-included to the new blood cells and respiratory pigment. There is no lack of iron on our planet. Iron is the second most common metallic element on Earth after aluminium. Despite the fact of the lack of an easily assimilated iron, evolution went on the iron-based blood physiology anyway. Thus, we can conclude that a hemoglobin-based pigment is more effective than other metals and there is no critical lack of iron for organisms in nature. But let's imagine another situation. On some exoplanet, there is less iron than on Earth, and there is excess of copper instead. What element will be chosen by evolution then? The answer is obvious. It will be copper-based respiratory pigment transferred with a baby blue blood. Could it really happen that some planet has more copper than iron in its crust? Let's have a look at our Sun. According to one study, Earth has more iron in its crust than the Sun has percentage-wise. And the Earth has a hundred times less copper than on the Sun. But the chemical composition of the Sun should correspond to the protoplanetary cloud from which Earth was formed. And if a very high concentration of iron can be caused by data inaccuracy, we still have a lack of copper. This obviously means that the answer is yes. The planet can have much more copper in its crust than we have now. It means that some exoplanet from which the ancient gods came from, according to ancient legends and stories, could have more copper than iron. I stand on the base of assumption that in some aspects, myths tell truth literally, including the part about the origins of the gods. In all mythology, gods that were giving knowledge come from the heavens. So that literally means that they came from the heavens, or how would we understand today from another planet? And I'm gravitating towards this version, not even because of ancient artifacts that exist and testify about highly advanced technologies, that also as an option suppose space origins of this advanced civilization, but because the space in which we live is equal. I mean, if these gods appeared from nowhere, ancients could say that they came from west, east, from the ground, from the top, etc. Everywhere in legends you'll find very specific origins of the ancient gods. Gods came from the heavens. So if the ancient gods arrived on our planet with its lack of copper and excess of iron relatively to them, they must have adapted to this new circumstance. Firstly, they should constantly replenish their organisms with copper. We know that erythrocytes, red blood cells that carry hemoglobin, live only 120 days. This is why constant replenishment with iron is required for blood formation. The same should be true for gods as well, but instead of iron, it should be copper. Secondly, iron is more chemically active element than copper. Thus, once in the blood of gods, it aims to substitute copper in chemical reactions. In other words, iron was toxic for them, and they would have to avoid it at any cost. The simplest way to battle iron is to stick to a specific copper-rich diet. Iron is very chemically aggressive and it starts to compete with copper once in the body. And if we suppose that species that arrived on our planet had a blue blood, which means copper-based blood, they found themselves into a situation where all fauna have iron-based physiology. Iron is toxic for them. They started moving humankind to the products that are more favorable for them, but not humans. This might shed light on the Neolithic Revolution when humanity universally switched from hunter-gathering to agriculture. 
The accepted narrative is that humans gave up hunting and gathering as soon as they discovered agricultural technology because it made life easier and safer. This is not quite right. On this account, the adoption of farming calls into question any simple narrative of human progression from hunting and foraging to swiddening and then to agriculture proper. Agriculture almost certainly entailed a large increase in drudgery and, as we shall see, declines in health and life expectancy. Looking backward, farming seems to be man's first major step toward civilization. It cannot, however, have looked that way to those who first embarked on it. There are plenty of ethnography research that shows that transitions from hunting and gathering to agriculture was extremely non-profitable for an ancient human. In fact, humans spent thousands of years trying to preserve their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. According to ancient legends and stories, the switch to agriculture wasn't our ancestors' idea at all. Knowledge and technology was granted by ancient gods in a ready-to-use form. Apparently, it had very strong connection to copper. So the products that ancients allegedly transitioned to, or in fact, they were forced to transition, all these grains are very poor for the iron. For instance, there's a lot of iron in legumes, vegetables, berries, strawberries and cherries in particular, and meat. Copper-rich products are grains, cereals, and bread. Basically, this switch from hunter-gathering to agriculture makes no sense because all the iron we needed was literally at hand. And we know that some communities, like Australian Aboriginals, spent thousands of years preserving their hunter-gatherer lifestyle. Under external pressure, humanity turned to production of poor for iron and rich for copper food, despite the fact that the human body never lacks copper even during pregnancy, when women experience a deficit of many microelements. So we can conclude that this decision was made by the gods for their own personal interest. Why ancients transitioned to the wheat-based agriculture and not to root vegetables agriculture that has 10 to 100 times more effective productivity? Because root vegetables are very rich for iron and this was not profitable to so-called gods. Moreover, cereals not only have little iron, they also have substances such as phosphates and phytins, which create sparingly soluble salts and reduce absorption of iron in the body. The hypothesis that ancient gods had hemocyanin-based blood allows us to look differently at some interesting details of the ancient legends and stories. Copper has strong antibacterial characteristics. Its healing properties have been known for a very long time and were used in the traditional medicine of many nations. Such antibacterial characteristics were even used in space medicine, where textile impregnated with copper kept medical tools sterile for nine months or more. A high concentration of copper in the gods' blue blood and a low amount of iron in their diet would boost antibacterial properties that their blood already had. Maybe this was the secret to their extremely long life, which almost looked like immortality to the ancients. Since copper is blue in the oxygenated state, species with blue blood would look paler than we do now. But since skin color comes from various, at least three, types of melanin, not our blood chemistry, it is unlikely there would be much difference in appearance, except a slight blue pallor. Ancient Indian gods are the best example of what they could look like. In nature, copper deposits contain a lot of silver, Silver accompanies a copper everywhere. This is so much a connected phenomenon that modern silver mining usually happens simultaneously with copper mining. Almost one-fifth of all the world's silver is mined from copper deposits. This means that on the planet of gods, there would be a lot of silver as well because the laws of physics work the same everywhere. Like copper, silver has very strong antibacterial properties. Water from silver jugs has tiny particles of silver in it that even in an extremely low concentration has antibacterial properties because silver can block the enzyme systems of microbes. 
and that also adds some credit to the immortality of gods. Moreover, it's widely known that an overdose of silver causes an irreversible change of skin color to bluish tones that in conjunction with the blue blood of gods can increase effect of the blue skin. Despite all its benefits, hemocyanin-based blue blood has a serious drawback in that it cannot effectively transport carbon dioxide out of cells. If the concentration of carbon dioxide increases in blood, this causes a high level of acidity and shift in pH of blood, which is bad for overall health. pH is an indicator of acidity or alkalinity of a solution. In our blood, hemoglobin takes care of about 75% of the ability of the blood to hold pH within a stable 7.35 to 7.45 value. And this value is stable, even under very radical changes in nutrition and other external factors. But the god's blue blood contains not hemoglobin, but hemocyanin, or another copper-based respiratory pigment that doesn't change its acidity with oxygen concentration. As a result, it is not capable of neutralizing negative changes from high concentrations of carbon dioxide. The result is a high blood acidity can cause more than 200 illnesses and cancer. A high level of acidity is the perfect environment for bacteria, viruses, parasites and the growth of cancer cells. To counter this situation, an organism would use the minerals in joints liquid, bones and teeth which will cause joint diseases, teeth cavities and osteoporosis of bones as well as collateral damage to the kidneys. Multiple studies have established that even a 0.1 shift of the blood pH value can cause serious harm to the body. The shift of the blood's pH by just 0.2 points will cause a coma. We can find the proof that such negative influence on ancient gods' physiology had taken place in historical documents. From the history of Egypt written by Egyptian priests and researcher Manetho, we know that in the first 12,300 years, Egypt was ruled by seven great gods. During the Second Dynasty, there were 12 divine rulers who ruled for 1,570 years, that is 130 years for each god. Then Egypt was ruled by semi-gods, each of them ruled for 120 years only. According to this data from Manetho, we can see a constant decline of their reigns. We can conclude that such long ruling periods of the first generation of gods could be a reason why people believe them to be immortal. But we shouldn't understand immortality here literally. As we know, gods at the end of their reign on earth departed to the afterlife where they continued their ruling. Sumerian and Indian gods were effectively able to kill each other, as did the gods of American Indians and gods of other nations. So if we look at terms of reign of gods of Egypt as defined by longevity of their life, we will see a clear reduction in life expectancy. Thus, the shortening of their life was constant and inevitable for them. There must be a reason why it happened, and it looks like it was the negative influence of environmental factors on our planet which were unfriendly for their physiology. That could happen only in one case. If the conditions on the Earth differed substantially from the conditions on the home planet of the gods with something very significant to them. But according to legends, this difference wasn't so different as to be crucial. The main group of the gods didn't use spacesuits, so the composition of the Earth's atmosphere was close to their homeland. Ancient legends and stories tell us that gods didn't leap about on the Earth's surface like astronauts on the Moon. Thus, their home planet's gravity was similar to ours. And as was mentioned before, they consumed Earth food but needed a special copper-rich diet. Here, we should recall our assumption that gods had copper-based blue blood that had a seriously limited ability to transport extra volumes of carbon dioxide out of their body. So this could be a crucial factor for them, because hemocyanin or other copper-based respiratory pigment, unlike humans' hemoglobin, did not have abilities to neutralize the excessive acidity in the blood. So the assumption of a copper-based blue blood 
has a lot of reference that can be found in the ancient legends. This, combined with real empirical understanding of the impacts of a civilization of gods on ancient society, might finally allow to understand some dramatic turns in our history.